Hi, good morning, everyone. This is Ravneet Pava. I'm the uh, Deputy Vice President, Global for Deakin University. Um, and I think I have met a lot of you over the you know, last couple of years as we celebrate our 25 years uh, in India. And I think working closely with you guys has been an absolute pleasure. I hope you're all doing well, and I do hope that we are able to um, have a good session today. So today we are going to be talking about the importance of um, upskilling. As we are in this very unprecedented times with COVID-19 and its impact to the corporate sector, its impact to our lives, both personally and professionally, what do we do next uh, is the question. And how do we actually deal with these changing times? Um, is, is going to be a big question for all of us uh, in, in the workforce. Um, a lot of you would also be thinking, what do I do to be different? And what do I do to ensure that at this point of time, I am not caught up um, you know, in, in redundancies and I'm not caught up losing my jobs? Um, to be very frank, these are really difficult times. And all of us understand that the need of the hour right now, as we speak, is to ensure that we retain our jobs, our work, and we are able to grow strongly. So how do we do that? And what is the way forward for us? The first thing I think the way forward for us is to really, really think about what are the skills that we need to have in this world to be global managers, to be global leaders. And I think the important factor here is it will have to be bite-sized cannot be long degrees that you will finish now and then you will get jobs later. That's one way of looking at it. But the other way of looking at it is, what do I do right now, which is bite-sized, which makes me employable, which makes me more engaged and which makes me more outcome focused. So the purpose of today's session with you all is to really talk about Deakin University through Deakin Core, the corporate arm of the university that we have developed these Deakin micro-credentials. I'm going to let the experts talk about what micro-credentialing is and what can we do to support your upskilling needs. And the need for today is really to think about how we can offer you, as our alumni, a unique proposition which is cost-effective and engaging. Uh, before I get into any uh, further introductions, let me ask you, a question. The COVID-19 pandemic has put forth some new challenges. In these uncertain times, would you be considering an opportunity to upskill to prepare for the future challenges? Yes or no? We expect your answers. I'll give you a couple of seconds before I get into the introduction of Glenn and Ash. Also, another question. Um, do you think employees recognition and upskilling go together? It will be good to hear what you guys think about this, because at the end of the day, it is important for all of us to understand that upskilling is the need of the hour as we get into the future. And it's not just in India. This is a worldwide phenomena that we need to be thinking about upskilling our skills, upskilling um, uh, you know, all of our uh, engagement uh, tools so that we are able to cope with the new challenges of the corporate world. All right, um, I'm going to start with introductions now. Let me introduce the three people you will be hearing from. The first one is Glenn Campbell. He's the executive director and CEO of Deacon Co. Glenn has worked for governments, government agencies and education providers since the mid 90s with career breaks in the private sector, including operating his own management advisory business. He has created success for businesses by approaching each workplace differently. He uses his skills and knowledge pragmatically to improve businesses, positioning them for the better performance. So thank you, Glenn, for being with us today and welcome. The second speaker is Ashley Jones. 
Chief Operations Officer and Head of Product at Deacon Co. As the Chief Operations Officer and Head of Product, Ash is responsible for the oversight of Deacon Co's product design and, sorry. which includes the educational content, learning design, sales marketing, and IT portfolios. Her remit is to assist Deacon Co's corporate and not-for-profit client identity, develop and deliver innovative educational solutions to meet their transitioning workplace needs. So perfect. I think it's really, really um, great to have you, Ash. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Ruth. The third person we have is uh, Mark Ryan. Mark Ryan is a strategic manager in the Pacific markets at Deacon Co. Mark is responsible for the development and execution of market entry strategies for Deacon Co across the Indo-Pacific region with an initial focus on India. So thank you, Mark, for being with us today. I'm now going to hand over to um, Glenn and Ash um, to really run the session. Thank you, Ravneet. Uh, and welcome everyone. We'll, we'll go through and just outline a little bit around what Deacon of a benefit to you. Uh, Mark, next slide. So, as alumni, of course, you're aware, very familiar with, De with Deakin University. Deakin Co. is part of the university. We're a division that sits within the Faculty of Business and Law, but work across the university, so all its faculties. And we specialise in providing um, professionals and their organisations with the skill and knowledge I, of course, you have already attained a qualification and, and that's a fantastic starting point and to your careers. But as Ravneet mentioned, as we move forward, the, the world is becoming more uncertain in its outlook and there really is a need to become much more, uh, to really stand out from the crowd. And, and this is where some of what we've been focusing on comes to the fore. Our credentials we've designed in a very unique way and we've designed them to focus in on recognising and assessing your existing skill and knowledge. We, cre we started the creation of these in 2014 and it is and really still remains the, the first and the most sophisticated model of skill assessment in the market. We developed the model directly as a result of the changing force around we were seeing around urban, uh, economic instabilities and also the emerging focus on skill capability that we were seeing from, the, from leading organisations around the world. And what credit, our former credentialing does is around future-proofing your employability and providing a much more sustainable capability uplift for you to thrive in the future of work. And it then gives you that edge against other people that you might be competing for work against. The credentials really do help you bolster that. This is your employability. We're focusing our credentials on the most important capabilities that all research around the world is coming out to show are the most significant and most important skills. Hi, Glenn. I'm, I'm sorry to just uh, button here. Uh, your uh, voice is uh, coming as a lag. So if you want to switch off your video, so that would that be useful. Thank you. Thanks, David. Yeah. 
So our credentialing isn't about taking in new information. Like I, I mentioned a little bit earlier, it's actually about assessing the skills and the knowledge that you as a professional already have. The credentials are delivered 100% online and they're completed through our own purpose-built web-based system. Early research by McKinsey, the World Economic Forum, KPMG and other leading organisations, Peter, over the past is essentially employability skills for the future of work are, sh uh, are focused around those credentials that we have. We currently have a suite of 29 different skills in our framework that assess at five distinct workforce levels from an entry level all the way through to the C-suite. Each credential has been aligned to the Indian and, also, and other major international skills and qualification frameworks that allow for capability assessment for the key employability, technical and leadership skills that are most important to employers. This is the current suite of credentials, uh, of skill capabilities that we have on, our, on offer. On the left, you'll see the list of human-centered skills, those that or we might sometimes call soft skills, things like teamwork, communication, critical thinking, skills about leadership. And leadership is at many levels in organizations, as you know. And then the emerging technical areas that are required in different roles and increasingly in more and more roles to different degrees. The, the, the ability now, if you're, in the, in, if you're a marketer, you also need to understand data analytics. If you're in HR, you also need to understand financial literacy. If you're an engineer, you also need to be able to lead and manage people. So these are the these set of criteria and not only relevant to any given profession or industry, but they're transferable across industries and across, across professions. And it's about not having all of them, but making sure that you have the ones that are most important for your career and for your, the people that you're considering working for. The candidate journey, now remember, this is an online journey. You start off by submitting evidence. There's three main components to this. The evidence that is submitted, is, there's two parts to this. One selection, and that's guided through a set of questions about, let's say we're, we're looking at problem solving. What does problem solve? The questions are around what does problem solving mean to you? What is your understanding of problem solving? You then submit evidence from your experience and from your career to date. There's then a video testimony that has to be done. We then have all of those pieces assessed by two different people, one academic and one industry. And that's to ensure that we have the, the rigor that comes from the academic world, but also the relevance that comes from a current practicing practitioner. There is an option to resubmit. And then on successful submission, a credential is awarded and feedback received from the two assessors. So we issue a digital badge through the Credly Acclaim platform. And you can share that badge digitally through platforms like LinkedIn. And you can also add it to your email signature or your resume. And if they're viewed electronically, they can click on that badge and go and see all of the metadata that sits behind it. And that's what we're showing there on the right of the screen as an example. So the, the digital badge is there in the, up in the top. You'll notice that at just on the bottom of that badge, there are five white shields represents the level criteria line that anyone can have a look to see what that is.
for you, our alumni, we want to be able to, to, to offer these credentials to you at a discount. We recognise as well that, you know, this, we are entering some very tough times. For, for many of you, you may not yet be back in, back at the, in your offices or workplace. But what we want to do is to discount this in recognition of your time with us and the value that we place on our alumni community. Our credentials can be done in a, in, in a number of different ways. They can be done as single offers in preset clusters. So what, for example, we know that if you were looking at, say, um, teamwork and communication, the evidence that you would supply to demonstrate one, say, communication, would also be the same evidence that you would use to demonstrate teamwork. So you can, in fact, undertake those two credentials and other combinations together at a reduced price. And then you can also undertake the four leadership credentials together. So there are not only the discount for you as alumni, but also the discount available through doing, doing credential assessments together. I'll hand that back over to Ravneet. Thanks, Glenn. Um, I think that was really informative and I think um, the deal for the Deakin alumni is really good because I do know that these credentials have a lot of value across the world over for enhancing employability and really understanding where you sit and what you can do going forward. Um, Glenn, um, let me ask you the four largest skill gaps today, according to the Deloitte to 2019, are not technical skills, but human skills, customer service, organization and management skills, digital literacy and leadership. What are your thoughts and how do you think these credentials can help? Sorry, Ravneet, I didn't catch that. My, my connection isn't too good this afternoon. Okay, do you want me to repeat the question? If you can, thank you. Now, I just said that the four larger skill gaps today, according to the Deloitte 2019 report, are not the technical skills, but the human skills, which are things like customer service, organization and management, digital literacy and leadership. What are your thoughts around this? And how do you think the credentials can help bridge these skills? Yeah, that's, that's right, because those, it's those skills, not the technical skills, that are the least likely to be automated. And they are the, the ones that make, make us truly human. They're the ones that machines cannot yet replicate. Um, and and that's, that's really significant. And what... And demonstrate innovation or teamwork through those skills, you can continue to build on in every job. Whereas what we're seeing with technology, of course, is that the technology lifespan becomes shorter and shorter. But the critical part about those most in-demand skills is that they cannot be automated out. We're always going to need them in jobs. What we're seeing around the world is employers are increasingly wanting to know if people can do those skills rather than just learning about them. And that thing is assessing to actually do those skills, not your ability to learn about them. Sure. Thanks for that. I agree with you that it's about, it's about, uh, you know, implementing and not just learning and not just knowledge on one side. Um, Ash, let me bring you in at this point. Um, you know, there have been significant job losses around the world. I mean, in India alone, we've, we're talking about 
uh, 1.2 um, million jobs being lost, uh, you know, in the last couple of months. What are your views on employment and hiring policies of organizations? And how do you see the credentials adding value to people who actually do undertake the credentials? Thanks, Ravni. And hi, everybody. Really an honor to be here to talk with you today. Um, look, as, as you've pointed out, Ravni, it's not just India, it's globally. We are seeing, in you know, particularly in this crisis, but also with automation, AI, virtual reality, all of that kind of digitization of the world, that jobs are um, shrinking. Um, and But as Glenn's eloquently pointed out, the fact is that what employers, whether it is a CPA or a Deloitte's or indeed IBM or any of the big four consulting companies are looking for are those that can actually show critical thinking, problem solving, the types of things that actually add value to a company so that they can pivot in these, you know, very difficult times. So not just doers, but those that can actually change um, very fast the pace or the way in which they're operating in an organization. Um, and how can you, how do you prove those skills? Um, it's all very well for us to use resumes and to say, yes, I'm a great communicator or yes, I can solve problems. But the fact of the matter is you've got to be able to show that, to be able to prove it. And so one of the reasons that we've worked so hard on this model is to be able to have two independent assessors show that a candidate actually has proven those soft skills, the ones that are being touted around the world as absolutely vital to um, the economic development of um, in the 21st century. Thanks for that, Ash. Uh, very well said that, I mean, I think we've got to gear up for what we need in the 21st century. There's no doubt about that. Um, also, uh, if both of you can answer the question, um, will there be any change in expectations around skill sets and competencies in this new, you know, sort of ever-changing dynamic world post um, COVID-19? I mean, are organizations going to um, really think about the kind of people they want to keep and the kind of people they want to hire? Uh, for example, you know, I was listening to a panel discussion the other day where they said that the need of the R is to create problem solvers and creative thinking, thinkers. You know, technical work can be done and that skill can be taught, but we really need to inculcate people, uh, you know, who can think um, sensitively, people, you know, who can think creatively, the design thinking around it, and also think about how we create problem solvers, because clearly we will be having problems in the world going forward, and how do we deal with all of those difficult decision making and dif difficult issues. So, do you think there is, post COVID-19, there is going to be a change in the kind of people the uh, um, corporate sector around the world is likely to hire? Absolutely. Sorry, I'm going to jump in there, Glenn. Um, yes, look, it's been um, some IBM research that was conducted just a couple of years ago showed that 71% of CEOs have cited that the human skills, the human centered skills of which, you know, problem solving and critical thinking are and have remained at the top of the list of required skills for the last 10 years, but they've actually progressed to the very top in terms of what is required. And the idea that, you know, businesses are either going to build skills or they're going to buy them. And what we're trying to say is that you can't actually buy those skills without proving the capability that they are around them. So consequently, if you want to differentiate yourself in this very difficult market, you have to prove absolutely that A, you can critically think, and that is irrespective of whether you're an engineer or an accountant or any of the, even working within AI or the you know, Internet of Things, you have to be able to differentiate yourself. And employers are really looking for that differentiation point. Yeah, and, and I'll add a little bit more to that, that what Ashley has said. I completely agree. Watch what's happening in the news at the moment with business leaders and what they're saying about what the world might look like after the pandemic. 
here here in Australia, we've we've been all working uh, from the majority of Australian business have been working from home, except for those in what retail outlets and uh, and hospitality and, and restaurant uh, grocery stores are still open. But we've had in this week alone, some businesses, uh, Westpac is, is one of those, one of our biggest banks. And I know they do have a, pres a, a small presence over, over in India, particularly if you're down and I think it's their offices down in Bangalore. But they've come out and said that for some of their workers, they're reconsidering whether they should work in an office at all because their productivity increased during the pandemic. What a lot of businesses are talking about is a different way of working. Uh, and it's not just here in Australia, it's around the world. And listen to what the types of skills that are going to be needed with that. Agility, digital literacy, the ability to interact with different types of technology. Communication skills become even more important when we're in these environments. Um, so... We we're not that the re past several years we're not seeing that change in the current climate if anything we're seeing a heightened focus on particular skills which are all those human skills that organizations are saying are even more important as we go forward yeah absolutely and i think we heard i mean i i'm sure my colleagues here would have also read that large companies like the Tata um, companies and also, um, you know, the, uh, the Reliance and all are all talking about huge job cuts that are also talking about uh, working uh, workforce for the next two years uh, from home. Um, and, and totally, you know, the, it's not easy to work from home. At the same time, you know, productivity could increase if you had the right skills to do so. So whether we end up working from home or we end up working in offices, Post COVID-19, it is a new world and we will need to adapt and adopt to changes and see how we are actually able to um, give our best shot going forward uh, into the near future with these challenging and changing times. Um, so I guess I'm gonna just move on to another poll question here. Um, according to Shamila, our HR manager at Cisco, Recruitment decisions are no longer just about skimming a resume for technical skills, you know, and I think what she's really saying is there needs to be evidence that a candidate will have the attitude and fit with the collaborative work culture. Do you agree that in order to succeed human skills are now as important as technical skills? All right. Um, also, another question, um, proven skill capabilities as opposed to titles or degrees. I'm not saying degrees are not important, but I'm saying that proven skill capabilities are even more important. The question is, will be the job currency of the future? Do you agree or disagree? All right, um, I'm going to now hand over to my colleague, Mark, to take the Q&A uh, sessions and moderate the session. So we are able to um, connect with the audience and the panel is able to answer the questions. Thanks, Ravneet, thanks very much. Um, firstly, uh, we've got a question, it's an anonymous question. Um, the question is how are our credentials, the Deakin credentials different uh, to the other uh, similar courses or assessments that are in the marketplace, for example, for example, those offered by LinkedIn Learning. Um, what is the value, the value addition or the value add of the Deakin credentials? Basically, how are they different to what uh, others are offering in the market currently? So, Glenn, Ash, uh, over to you. Um, okay, look, this is a totally unique model. We are groundbreaking, I can't even say that, groundbreaking in the world. Um, this is all about, it's not about learning. It's not a, a, a LinkedIn 
um, course where you do it and then you get a badge because you've completed a course. Anyone can do that. Anyone can say, yes, I've done this. Yes, I've done that. What the credentials do is you actually have to prove capability against various different criteria to show that you are a really good expert communicator. And so consequently, you have to package evidence to show that that is what you can do. And then it gets sent off to two people that you have never met, one academic, one from industry, who then determines whether or not your evidence shows that you meet the criteria of a framework that has been put together from multiple frameworks around the world. You then get a badge with metadata sitting behind it that shows what it is that you actually met in order to achieve that digital badge. This is even more rigorous than your university courses where you had a tutor or a lecturer that was assessing your work. These are two independent people that you have never met before who have no reason outside of wanting to um, determine that you are good at what you do, giving you validation that you are actually meeting a particular level of um, capability. It's very unique. Yeah, if I can add to that as well, what we've, what we've really done here is change the, the dynamic around how we normally learn, assess and apply our knowledge. Traditionally, and, and what you're, you're more used to from a university degree, is that you learn material, you're then assessed, then you go out into the workplace. Well, increasingly what we're hearing is that's fine at the start of someone's career continue off that we recognize that you you learn things while you're at university you learn things while you're on the job then you undertake the assessment so so what we're doing is moving where we place assessment from the focusing in on the the learning to focusing the assessment on the actual doing and that meets the business demand more than shorter courses where you're learning bite-sized pieces of information. They're important. I don't want to discredit that learning inf new information is absolutely important. But what employers want to know and what sets you apart is that, you can, that you've been assessed as being capable of doing that function. And if you're going for a job and, and the other 15 people say that they've learnt about it and you're the only one that can demonstrate that you've been assessed as being able to do it, you're ahead of the game. Also, if I can just add that uh, these credentials, um, you know, are um, also mapped up to uh, professional practice and degrees into the future. Also, um, they are mapped up to world standards. So there is an understanding across on the section about uh, what does it mean if you have these credentials at different levels, uh, whether it's um, you know, expert level or it's a lower level than that. And that can define your role and position in your um, uh, companies as well. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, panelists. I'm not doing the questions in order, by the way, in case people are wondering. I'm just sort of grouping them as they come. So we have a question from Sri Ganesh, um, wondering whether for the assessments undertaken uh, against the credentials for alumni in India, would the industry assessor be from India themselves? So would the assessor, the, in, the industry assessor be based in India or in Australia? Yes, the assessor will be based in India. Uh, we're working with some of India's largest corporates to build up our pool of assessors. Uh, what we will, however, do to, main sure, to ensure that we still have all of our credentials, we have a centralised moderation um, exercise that does come out of Australia. But primarily, the assessors will be industry assessors from some of India's biggest corporates. Okay, thanks, Glenn. Uh, the next question from Anup. Um, thank you, Anup. You um, made the observation that it's a great concept and uh, the credentials are extremely relevant. Um, your question relates to how will Deakin get 
um, I guess, the industry, Indian industry, aware of, of the offering um, and how will Indian industry deem it to be relevant um, and recognised um, within within the market in India. Um, Glenn, Ash and Ravnet, you're all well positioned. I know we've done a lot of work in this space, so perhaps you could um, shed a bit of light on what we've been doing in, um, in the, over the last few months in India. So maybe I could give it a quick start. Um, so we've been working with, uh, you know, the concept uh, of micro-credentials has been a new one, especially for the corporates in India. And we've been working with large companies and, um, you know, large uh, associations and organizations uh, dealing in the corporate sector about what is the need of the R and how does it operate and how does it work. Um, and we have got an amazing response from both industry as well as associations that this is the way to go and they're very keen to uh, cooperate and work with us. Um, and I think in, in the next couple of months, just when things settle down a little bit, we will have signed deals with large companies as well uh, going forward. Okay, thank you, Ravneet. Um, from Sri Ganesh, again, uh, what are the detailed steps for assessment? Um, if an alumni already has a continuing industry recognition like a PMI or ACS, certi certified professionals, for instance, would that be taken into consideration for the Deakin assessment directly? That's a brilliant question and the answer is absolutely yes. So those vendor certifications or professional association qualifications would count as a piece of evidence of professionalism within a, uh, within a particular area, um, such as an IT discipline. Um, but we would also ask for three, two or three other pieces to supplement that, to be able to show that not only have you reached a particular standard within your discipline, but you've, you've then been able to um, show that within the industry itself. Terrific, thank you, Ash. Um, Prashant, thanks for your patience. Um, Prashant's question relates to Deakin University support for those that have returned um, from undertaking study in Australia. Um, Prashant said it, it's difficult finding a job, of course, it always is when one is starting out. So um, what are the, what's in place and what are the plans in terms of a support system for Deakin alumni coming back to India? So Ravneet, I might uh, pass that to yourself. Sure. Um, I don't know whether you're aware, but the Deakin University office here, which is based out of Saket, um, has a person, I think she's on this uh, call as well, her name is Geeta, who helps in job placements and association and connection with industry. So what I would recommend is all alumni who are looking for support for jobs uh, should connect with the office here um, and, and provide all your details and hopefully we should be able to support your initiatives of finding jobs. Terrific, thanks Ravneet. Um, and to Udit, um, how do we see digital marketing? How do we think the panel, how does the panel think digital marketing will change um, around consumer behaviour? And he's obviously from the pharmaceutical sector, so wondering, you know, just making the observation there that um, uh, in-clinic communication seems to be the ideal phenomena, according to Udit. So, so yeah, how do we see digital marketing um, um, working with and, uh, and further changing consumer behaviour? It's, um, that's a very good question, Udit, because, um, you know, digital marketing is now ubiquitous. It is taking over no matter which vertical you work in. Um, and in fact, that's one of the reasons that we have digital marketing credentials to be able to show irrespective of which area you um, work in, that you are able to operate in that space. Um, but getting to your point about um, in clinician communication, again, absolutely absolutely vital um, and getting back to Glenn's previous comments about how the digital marketing, the automation, yes, will revolutionize the way things are, but to be able to prove um, capability at um, an expert level in that in clinician um, communication space would actually make you stand out as um, within the pharmaceutical industry. Terrific. Thank you, Ash. That's, um, that's all the questions that have come through from participants. I've got one myself, if I may, that I'd like to address to, um, to all of the panel. 
Um, and it relates to something that we've already touched on about recognition of the credentials within the, um, the Indian corporate space. Um, Glenn, your presentation noted the benefits to the individual, the actual candidates undertaking the credentials in terms of you know, standing out um, and, and demonstrating actual capabilities in addition to, to knowledge gained through more traditional um, tertiary education. What's the benefit, how, how are you addressing corporate, or how are we addressing corporate India in terms of the benefit to the actual corporates themselves um, of um, undertaking or putting staff through the credential process that Deakin offers? Thanks, Mark. We're doing this in a number of different ways. To where if the starting point really is around what is the organisation's pressure point? And for some organisations, it's around how do we make sure that we're promoting the best people? So they're starting to look at that even at, at up into their senior executive levels to say that there is a benchmark that you need to be able to attain to progress to the next level. And they're looking at using our credentials as, that, as part of that benchmark exercise. And the, what, what has attracted em, the employers in India to this is that it is absolutely independent. Um, so the assessment is independent. It's not about picking favourites. So, so that's one area that we've been looking at. Um, and that same model is being used in different areas. Another area that a few of the corporates we're talking about is to look at particularly new skills that are emerging that they know that they've got a weakness in of how do they, how do they, they can certainly train their staff, but how do they know that training has made a difference to their staff? And so they're wanting to, they, they're doing their own training, but they're then wanting to use our credential to verify that the person has applied what they've learnt from the company. Terrific. Thanks. Um, thanks very much, Glenn. Rubnet, I might uh, hand back to yourself um, unless anybody else would like to send through some questions uh, immediately. But I've um, I've run out of uh, questions myself. If anybody else, please feel free. Sure. If there are any more questions, we are more than happy to take the questions. Um, um, otherwise, I think uh, it's been an it's been a very interesting, thought-provoking uh, discussion. I think. Um, I think, from my perspective, um, as a as an employer, I think it's really important for employees to understand that the same old process is not going to work anymore. We've got to think out of the box. We've got to be more productive. We've got to think about the skill sets that we need to uh, enhance. Uh, and progress with into the near future? And how are we going to actually get ourselves in a better position to handle our jobs and also to be in the workplace which is going to be ever so dynamic and ever changing? So the, the Deacon Credentials um, is, is a really very, very innovative, interesting concept. And um, I think it's worth looking at if you are interested in, we are more than happy um, to give you more information and more detail and discuss your uh, possible plan, um, you know, in terms of how to cluster the credentials uh, and how do you actually move forward and at what level you should be engaging. So um, thank you very much, Glenn and Ash and Mark for being with us here today. Um, I do know that Australia is doing very well, uh, you know, at least from a health perspective, in these difficult pandemic times. Of course, the economic um, impact is going to be hard for everyone and we will all need to sail through that. But I do hope that India settles down as well and we all stay safe and um, I look forward to engaging with you all. Thank you, alumni. Thank you for being such wonderful audience. And also thank you for being our brand ambassadors and working with us and the office here, Kanika, who is also in the call is in touch with you, I know, on a regular basis. And let us know what you'd like us to focus on going into the future. I mean, are you really keen on bite-sized, short webinars where we can even focus on certain skill sets 
um, more in detail and, and the how of it, um, or you're looking at large panel discussions that we can bring to you. So let us know what you think will really add value to your professional development, and we will be very happy um, to work with you and the Deakin Alumni Committee to see how we can be of value addition to you as we go into the future. So thank you all very much. Thank you to my staff for organizing this and look forward to being in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Rafnaid. Thanks all.